content warning. Depictions of blood, violence, war, and giant spiders. If you're a long-time fan of horror, you probably don't need me to tell you that the term elevated horror is kind of elitist bullshit. There have already been multiple articles and think pieces about this subject, and my opinion doesn't differ too much from writers like Jacob Knight. But I'm gonna talk about it anyway, because not only is it very fun to point out when people are, like, completely wrong... No, that's actually it. The biggest problem with elevated horror is that no one, not even the people who use the term unironically, seem to know what it actually means. People know about the films that are associated with the term, like The Witch, Get Out, Hereditary, and The Borbendork. But wherever I look, I can't seem to find anyone who can convincingly explain why these films belong together. They all came out during the 2010s. They're not too heavy on jump scares, even though they have those. And they don't contain too much gore, even though they have that. One could argue that this supposed subgenre is mainly about tackling difficult subject matters, like troubled families, mental health, or racism. But subtext existed in horror films long before 2010. Why do you think the director behind Get Out, a very political horror film about systemic racism, decided to work on a remake of Candyman from 1992? Actually, no. Even though he doesn't personally agree with it, Andy Crump from The Hollywood Reporter explains the point of the term a lot better. Elevated horror is a reassurance. Don't worry. It says soothingly. This horror movie isn't a mindlessly violent, total exploitative slasher or torture porn flick. This horror movie is serious. It's art. What elevated horror basically boils down to, from an audience perspective, is I don't feel embarrassed for liking this, and since I view my particular taste in films as superior to the average horror fans, that means it can't be a normal horror film. You can add elevated to any other genre and it will immediately reveal how silly the whole thing is. Airplane isn't a comedy. It's an elevated comedy. I literally can't say that without laughing. <laughs> I'm sorry. The truth is that what people call elevated horror films today have existed for as long as horror films. The Shining from 1980 could be considered an elevated horror film. So could The Night of the Living Dead from 1968. Or maybe even The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari from 1920. So why is the term being used now? Well, if there is one thing that makes elevated horror useful, it's that it sheds a light on the actual purpose of categorizing things into genres in the first place. Horror has not been a very well-respected genre in the eyes of movie execs and critics for quite some time. There have obviously been a bunch of box office successes, some have even gained Academy Awards. But even so, there have been plenty of horror films that people have tried to avoid even calling horror because of what people usually associate with the label. When The Exorcist came out, everyone knew it was classy, but no one was questioning whether or not it was a horror film. It was clearly a horror film. Yeah, no one has ever questioned if The Exorcist is a horror film. Except for the film's director, William Friedkin. Wait, what? Filmmakers still have to sometimes pitch their ideas as anything but horror so that their films will actually get greenlit. Yeah, the Saw franchise used to be hugely successful, but imagine trying to elevator pitch the idea of a horror film about people mutilating each other to a studio who is looking to be taken seriously. The premise of horror films tend to sound either really gross, really silly, or both. For horror fans, me included, that's just part of the appeal. Personally, I think it's great how horror embraces those silly aspects of not just our own fears, but the silliness of human imagination as a whole. Horror is silly because we are, no matter how much we would like to hide it. The reason why there are so many wacky horror films is not because horror is a stupid genre for stupid people, but because these films reflect all the various fears and phobias that people actually have. You might find a film about giant spiders absolutely ridiculous, but to someone else, that might be the scariest thing imaginable. But silliness is, of course, at odds with seriousness. And that's probably why Friedkin didn't consider The Exorcist to be a horror film, and it's 
definitely the reason why The Silence of the Lambs was called a psychological thriller. Because when you market your film, that's clearly a horror film, as a post-horror, or extreme drama, or simply a thriller, that's when you can get Oscars. And Oscars don't just result in effective marketing and ticket sales. It comes with prestige. Not the film prestige, that would be horrible, because who likes Christopher Nolan in 2020? <laughs> Brad Pitt probably doesn't want to be in any regular horror film, but he might consider joining the cast of a film that's directed by Oscar winner and elevated social thriller horror man Jordan Peele. Yeah, he did say yes to David Fincher when he was still mostly famous for making music videos and Alien 3. But Seven was, of course, not marketed as a horror film but a crime thriller. But what even is the difference between a term like thriller and horror? The word thrill can refer to stress and unease, which sounds very horror-related, but it can also refer to excitement and tension, which sounds a lot like things we usually associate with action films. So is a thriller basically a film with horror and action elements? Well, no. There are films that are considered thrillers that don't exactly feel like horror films at all. And there are horror films that are also considered to be action films. And remember Michael Jackson's music video for Thriller? Isn't that actually a horror film? It's almost as if these terms don't exactly have much meaning when you take a closer look at them, do they? You know how we differentiate between comic book and graphic novel, even though the words essentially mean the same thing? It's almost exactly like that. If there is even the smallest chance that a product will eventually make money, Companies will rebrand said product until people accept it and find interest in it. They didn't want to buy your shitty floor cleaner? Well, no worries. Now it's a highly profitable mouthwash, and it's called Listerine. People in general like to categorize stuff. It's convenient. I mean, imagine having to navigate an even worse version of Netflix where you can't search for specific genres. But one should never forget that the genre a film has been labeled with is, more importantly, being used as a marketing term. Like, why isn't basically all war films labeled as horror films? Surely war is one of the most horrific things imaginable. Maybe because a lot of studios would like you to think that war is a heroic necessity, rather than the absolutely horrible thing that it truly is. I swear I didn't edit that music, that was actually in the trailer. Horror in itself is incredibly hard to define. What I might consider to be the main characteristics of horror films probably differs from your perception, even though it might just be slightly different. Genres aren't just trying to describe what happens in a story, but how that story will make you feel. And some people might be scared of horror, while others aren't. Does that mean that films that fail to scare general audiences shouldn't be considered horror films? Of course not. There are established subgenres that helpfully categorize different kinds of horror stories. But elevated horror, as the name suggests, isn't about putting these films beside other horror films, but above them. The label might be new, but the tactic is, as we have established, quite the opposite. And personally, I'm getting a bit sick of it. Because as someone who's written about video games for like 10 years now, I'm all too familiar with this kind of thing. The self-proclaimed uphill battle. The quest for legitimacy. Finally, video games are art, comparable to films, they said after the release of The Last of Us in 2013 and The Last of Us Part Two in 2020. <laughs> Video games, as an art form, don't need to prove anything to anyone. And neither do horror films. And if they needed to, there is evidence stretching back literally a hundred years that horror never needed to be elevated. Because it was already pretty high up quality-wise, if you knew where to look. But of course, there are some people who are claiming that horror fans are just being overly defensive about all of this. Horror fans are like music fans who complain that their favorite indie band isn't popular, but then get upset when it is. We like the slightly forbidden nature of horror. We like the fact that it's often crude and exploitative and appeals to our worst instincts, and at heart, 
That's why we get so touchy about elevated horror. We don't want our horror to be elevated. Stop elevating it. That indie band comparison is really odd, because the horror genre as a whole is popular, and it has been for quite some time. And it's not like horror fans didn't already know that. In the last couple of decades alone, there have been several horror films that have grossed hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office. The 2017 remake of It, for example, grossed 700 million dollars. Not to mention a little show called Stranger Things, which was viewed by 40 million households when its third season was released on Netflix. I don't think that anyone who is against the term elevated horror is against the films that the term is trying to describe. Not me, at least. I love Get Out, I love The Invisible Man, and I love The Lighthouse. I have no issue with the specific kind of horror they're striving to be. And I don't think that any horror fan is claiming that these types of horror films can't be good or that they've made horror uncool or mainstream or whatever. People are more than able to appreciate small indie stuff just as much as mainstream successes, like it. But okay, if we're not gonna use the term elevated horror to describe these films, what do we do instead? Well, my first thought went to the golden age of television. An era in between the late 1940s and 50s when television programming apparently was pretty good. The term was even reused in the early 2000s when they aired a bunch of shows that you've actually heard of. Calling these periods golden ages didn't mean that everyone thought that all the other TV shows that aired before or after were bad. It just points out that there were a lot of great TV shows that came out during the same time. Which is also the one thing that all of these supposed elevated horror films objectively have in common. Not that they were objectively great, but that they came out during the same time period. And there were even more great horror films than that during the 2010s. This was the decade when a bunch of filmmakers realized how to make subversive horror films without doing the scream approach of just pointing at a TV screen saying, That's a thing that happens in horror! Do you like scary movies? What's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Isn't it funny how we said that in a horror film? The Cabin in the Woods might be the greatest example. A great allegorical film about the process of how horror films are made and why they are made like that. We also got Your Next, a film where the female protagonist is way more dangerous than the typical horror home invaders that are trying to take her out. And my personal favorites, the Happy Death Day films. Not only are they a fun subversion of the trope where the blonde girl who dies at the beginning of the film resurrects every time she's killed, they're some of the most enjoyable and genuinely heartfelt genre-bending experiences I've ever had. Oh, and let's not forget such great films like Raw, It Follows, Train to Basson, The Love Witch, Green Room, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, Ready or Not, Mandy, Krampus, I Saw the Devil, What We Do in the Shadows, and basically everything Mike Flanagan directed. Calling the 2010s a golden age of horror might not be very imaginative, but at least it's a lot more truthful and less condescending than calling it the age of elevated horror. Maybe it's recency bias. But I truly feel that the 2010s have been one of the best decades for horror, and it really sucks that these great cinematic achievements are being undermined by a select few simply because people can't admit that horror has always been good. And I think few people said it better than the director behind the supposed elevated horror film, The Invisible Man. I don't necessarily think horror has changed. I think it's always evolving. It goes through these little micro trends and these ebbs and flows. There's so many different subgenres of horror that each one has its moment in the sun. Slasher films will be popular for a while, a year or so, and then they'll leave. But then ghost movies will come in, and zombie movies, and pretty soon monster movies are gonna have a moment. It really depends on which subgenre of horror is having its moment on this carousel of popularity. Something that's been talked about a lot right now is this so called elevated horror, which is code for horror that's okay to like. And if anyone tried to present that to me as a new thing, like critics are really loving it right now, that's never happened before, I'd be like, 
The Exorcist? I mean, that was nominated for Best Picture. It's not a new thing. Thank you so much for watching. You would not have watched this video if it weren't for the generous people who support me on Patreon. And I want to give a special thanks to Nichtschwert, Sindri Orben, Tobias Mattsson, Hovard Kugerud, Professor Flowers, Winders, Philip Kirschner, and Odrew. Wow, it's actually starting to become a long list now. Had I known that people would like my stuff this much, I would have started making videos in English way sooner. Thank you so much, all of you. If you want to become a patron as well, not only will you help this channel a great deal, you also get to see all future videos earlier than everyone else. And you get access to the Discord server, where we do movie nights and stuff. I'd also like to thank the people who provided their voices for this video. So in order of appearance, Kiki from Transparency, Deadman Animations, That Jess, and Jacob Geller. These people do amazing work. Much more amazing than mine, if we're being honest. And if you haven't already, you really have to check out their channels. You'll find links in the description. I hope to see you all again soon. In fact, next time, you're all invited to one of my favorite restaurants. <laughs>